So I've been overly excited about the new Deadpool and Wolverine movie lately because, you know, And since I have negative artistic skills, I decided to make this over-engineered shader that renders the movie's logo in real time with just math. Here's how I did it. Okay, so how can we even draw something with just math? There are many techniques actually, but the one I used in this video is called ray marching. The idea is pretty simple. For each pixel in the camera, you shoot a ray that gradually steps through the scene based on the distance from its closest object. For instance, here we start our ray at minus 2.5 units from the origin pointing forward. We then check all objects in the scene and find that the closest is this red sphere. Then we offset the ray origin by this distance and repeat the process. This goes again and again until the closest distance is very small, which means we've hit an object, or very large, which means we didn't hit anything. This allows programmers to draw complex shapes from mathematical functions alone and even merge them together in interesting ways. Believe it or not, everything you see here is rendered using ray marching. Okay, so we are going to draw the Deadpool's logo first. The first thing we do is set up the ray marching loop. Again, we are starting at minus 2.5 from the origin. Then we iterate at most 100 times, breaking early if the distance is very small or above our maximum. Then we will return the color of the closest surface divided by the accumulated distance. You will see what this means in a bit. Let's finally implement the ray marching function. We start by checking our position against the cylinder of height 0.15 and radius 1.2. If we now add a color to our result, you can see the cylinder on the screen. This doesn't look much like a cylinder, but if I make the object rotate, you'll see that it actually is a cylinder. By the way, if you want me to make introductory videos on how to write shaders like this one, let me know in the comments. Now we need to draw the black cylinder, and here's where things get interesting. Because the inner cylinder is smaller, we can't just draw both cylinders as the outer one will always be hit first. Instead, we need to cut a hole in the outer cylinder using the ray marching subtract operation. Then, we can check which cylinder is closest and return the respective color. Using a similar principle, we can draw Deadpool's eyes, which are also just two other cylinders combined with a subtraction operation. We create a function receiving the position and a multiplier indicating if it's the right or left eye. We then slightly offset the position and draw the first cylinder. Then we offset the position again, up into the side, and subtract the second cylinder from the first, getting us these cool Deadpool eyes. You can also scale each coordinate to get a more interesting shape. Note that we actually divide the coordinate in order to increase the scale. Imagine as if we are scaling the entire axis down, which is equivalent to getting closer to the object, making it appear larger. Going back to our ray marching function, we can wrap it up by drawing a box in the center and then merging it with the outer cylinder. And that's pretty much it for Deadpool. However, the scene still looks a little dull with this black background and no lighting. Let's fix that. Let's create a background function that will create a grid pattern with two colors. The UVs are analogous to the screen coordinates, and in our shader they go from minus one to one in each direction. If we scale up the UV, it will saturate the colors, making them sharper. And if we now apply a rectangle distance function, we get a square in the center of the screen. If we now apply the mod function, which returns the remainder of the division between two numbers, we get a repeating pattern of squares. Note that we offset the result in order to center the squares. Let's now multiply the UV by a much larger number, like 150, then repeat the rectangle pattern operation with different values and add the results. Now let's add a nice 45 degrees rotation to this grid and use the values to mix between the two background colors, getting us this nice grid effect. Finally, let's add a vignette effect on top of the background to make it more interesting. Going back to our main function, we can add the background by mixing the logo's color and the background color with T as a factor. Note the use of the step function here, which will return zero if T is below our max distance and one if it's above. Now let's move to Wolverine's logo. The good part is that the base shape is pretty much the same as the in the Deadpool logo, so we can reuse most of the code and just change the colors. For the eyes, we also create a function receiving a multiplier, but now the implementation will be quite different. This time I went with a triangle shape with 0.21 for the sides and 0.17 for the thickness. The distance function we are using always generate triangles with equal sides but we can work around that by applying non-uniform scaling to the axis just like last time. In this case, we scale the triangle's base by 1.7 and shrink the height by 1.2. Finally, we rotate the triangles to get Wolverine's eyes. 
Now the iframe gave me a lot of headache. First, I tried building the shape by merging multiple triangles, just like Deadpool's eyes, but the results looked very wrong. I also think my non-uniform scaling workaround was breaking the union operations, because they started not making any sense after a while. After hours trying, I finally found this distance function for a diamond shape, which made things so much easier. So here we create the first diamond shape using the SD rhombus function. The distance function works by passing the lengths for each side of the rhombus, its thickness and corner radius. And the same scaling and rotation rules apply. Then we create a second diamond shape with slight offsets for position and rotation. We can now merge them using the union operation. But in this case, if we use the smooth union instead, we get a nicer looking result. If we now integrate this function with the rest of our ray marching code, we get our Wolverine logo. Now, how do we merge the two shapes? Try pausing the video and use what you learned about ray marching to take a guess. Let's start with the background, which is easier. In this case, we generate two backgrounds with different colors, and then we just need to interpolate between the two based on the UVX coordinate. As I mentioned, our UVs go from minus one to one, so we multiply by 0 0.5 and add 0 0.5 to shift the range to between zero and one. This is enough to lerp between the backgrounds, but if we apply the smooth step function, we get a nicer effect. Now to merge the actual logo shapes, we first need to cut them in half. Here at the end of our ray marching function, we define a large box that occupies half of the screen. Then, if we subtract our logo and the box, we essentially cut the logo in half. We can do the same thing for the Wolverine logo, but on the other side of the screen. Back to our main function, we simply draw both halves of the logo and pick the one with the closest hit. Cool, right? Now our logo is perfect. Well, almost. We still need to implement lighting. Now, I won't explain all the details of lighting calculation here, as this is an entire video on its own, but here's the high level. In order to calculate lighting for a surface, the first thing you need is the surface's normal. This is a vector that is perpendicular to the surface, and it's crucial for any lighting calculation. Then, let's define a directional light to represent our sun. With that, we can calculate the diffuse lighting, which is an approximation of how light scatters in all directions when hitting a surface, and it's proportional to the angle between the light direction and the normal vector. This gives a rough sense of depth to the surface. Moving forward, we can calculate the specular lighting. This effect represents how shiny the object is, and is particularly important for metallic objects like our logo. The calculation takes into account the view direction, which is the direction our camera is looking, the light direction, and a shininess factor. By the way, if you are wondering, none of that makes any physical sense. Those are just heuristics that kind of relate to actual lighting behavior, but are fast enough to calculate in real time, so games have been using that for a while. If we wanted to have beautiful realistic lighting, we would have to apply more advanced techniques like PBR, global illumination, and ray tracing which are all subjects that I plan to cover in this channel, so, you know, subscribe. Anyway, back to our lighting function. We now just add a ambient factor, which is literally a color we add to everything, which helps prevent super dark areas and control the mood of the scene. And what you have just seen here is the Fong shading model. That is probably in most 3D games you played, and it's not that complicated, right? Now back to our logo rendering function, we can add the lighting calculations at the end, if we hit any surface. The normals are calculated by actually sampling the scene in slightly different points along the current point and averaging the results. And the calculate lighting function is similar to what we just saw. And now our logo has lighting. Beautiful. Let me know what shader you want to see next in the comments, and I'll see you on the next one.